Hey, Barrett Edelstein here, your celeb expert and your celeb savant. Celeb Savant is a weekly entertainment show. We have long-form career retrospective type interviews with celebrities, singers, actors, and industry experts. Jethro Sheeran, who goes by the professional name Alone Star, is a British musician, music producer, rapper, and fashion model from Bristol, United Kingdom. He is a number one Billboard and multi-award winning artist who's collaborated with several famous musicians, including Tupac, Chris Brown, Lil Wayne, Macy Gray, Akon, DaBaby, Freeway, Snoop Dogg, Michael Jackson, Rick Ross, Triple Red, Young Thug, Wiz Khalifa, amongst many others. Alone Star is the first cousin of Ed Sheeran, as their fathers are brothers. Alone Star has written and produced songs with his cousin Ed Sheeran. Up next on Celeb Savant, we've got Jethro Sheeran, otherwise also known as a Lone Star. Where do we find you in the world? How are you doing and what's happening in your life? Um, thank you for having me. Firstly, uh, I am currently in Denmark. I reside here. I'm from the UK, a town called Bristol. Lived in London for 10 years. I lived in Trinidad for about four years on and off between there and Bristol and London. And um, currently, yeah, I reside in my studios in Denmark now just because my daughter's mother moved here and I used to come and visit a lot. And um, yeah, I just fell in love with the place. So that's where I'm. That's what I call home now. I have a house here and a studio and um, I'm continuing with my record label, Urban Angel records here and just building a, a big platform for my artists myself at the moment Lovely. it's been great i've been here since lockdown so that was my my biggest year because uh, i wasn't touring and i was just concentrating on releasing music so yeah that's me jeff lone star sharing in denmark living and loving life <laughs> brilliant let's rewind it all the way back to the beginning at what age were you did you recognize whether it was as a child or teenager that, okay, cool, I want to get myself involved or be in the entertainment industry? How did that transpire and progress to where we are now? So the long version or the hybrid version of Jethro's entertainment story. Okay, so when I got into music and I started off uh, writing poetry, probably about 10 years old I didn't really look into being like an entertainer it was purely therapy for me so I was uh writing poetry because it was I was just talking about things at school why mm -hmm. you know, the teacher I didn't like or the girl I fancied and loved or whatever people that didn't like me but I didn't you know so I was just writing down all my fears anxieties and insecurities and that's why I'm actually called a lone star because um my mum used to come into the bedroom and we'd just gone into a new house and there was no curtains in my bedroom at the time and uh, there was a North Star that would just beam down uh, into my room. So she'd come and turn the lights out. You know, you, you have to go to bed early because school tomorrow and all of that. And uh, I used to have a pen and pad underneath my bed. And as soon as uh, she left the room, then I'd start writing poetry underneath the, this North Star. So it became like a lone star. And also at the time, I just felt really alone. And also since then, when I started developing into more professional and more kind of like entertainment vibes like music wise I was doing everything myself so I was writing singing rapping uh doing the production and the music <clears throat> even though it's pretty bad back then but um yeah I, so I kind of called myself a lone star when I was about 19 years old and then I started to take music quite seriously and then I heard a song by Tupac uh, called Dear Mama, which really kind of changed my life because I thought this, you know, hard um, gangster rapper, he can write love song about his mother and be, mm. uh, you know, really in, you know, soft and kind and nice. And like, I just really kind of thought, OK, maybe I could be a rapper. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I wrote a song about my mum after that. You know, I started to kind of turn poetry into raps and I was mm. trying to sing. I couldn't sing very well. And then I just kind of yeah, formed this kind of vocal style. I was from Bristol in the UK. So, you know, the, the main big bands there was like Porter's Head and Massive Attack. They're quite melancholic. So I was listening to them a lot. Actually, they're working for my stepdad. So I got to know them really well. And I kind of really delved into that Bristol sound. And it kind of developed into kind of this live sounding cinematic hip hop sort of vocal thing. And then, obviously, Ed Sheeran is a cousin of mine, and mm -hmm. we were the only two Sheerans in the music, uh, sorry, in the family that were into music, like, so passionately. And uh, he was much more into the kind of 
guitar bass singer songwriter stuff that he is today but but i was more hip-hop and rap so when we got together at weddings and funerals and birthdays in the family we used to kind of collaborate and um perform for the family and he plays guitar and sing the choruses and i would um kind of do the drums um even if it is playing out of a sampler or something or mm. uh just rap over his guitar and then it kind of kind of developed a different sound once again so it's kind of folky rap with storytelling we're both into really like hip-hop artists like nas and real kind of painting pictures in your music and your storytelling in you know singing or rapping so that kind of developed organically and naturally as well so it kind of that's sort of my background how i kind of got into sort of the music business and then in 2004 is when i started my label urban angel with ed and uh we released a a new my first ep was called clipped wings that he featured on and then he had his ep um which i featured on that and um mine was more hip-hop his was more singer songwriter sort of stuff he kind of produced loosely his one and i did mine and then just kind of we continued our paths and uh he continued to be one of the biggest stars in the world which is amazing um and uh, I just developed into uh, more of a hip hop kind of independent artist. I run my own record label. I do all my releases myself. Um, I've had a deal with Sony, which was a distro deal. So I've got an um, advance and I use that money to develop my label, basically. And then here we are today, 100 million streams. Independent wow. myself. So, yeah, very proud of that. Uh, when I was reading your Wikipedia page, it mentioned that you collaborate, have collaborated with a number of artists besides Ed. And I see you've got a new... A remix or collaboration with Macy Gray that has just recently come out. Yeah, that was released last Friday. Yes. So it's the end of June, and that came out last Friday, and it's done over um, a third of a million streams. So wow. 360,000, I think. So I'm really pleased about that because I'm a huge fan of Macy Gray when she was um, doing her, you know, her thing back then, and uh, I saw her live, paid to see a ticket in London. and um, But now, yeah. It's it's just I'm so happy about this track because it's kind of yeah it's a it's a 20 year old producer from Denmark who's never had more than 50 streams in all his songs released and then he's kind of get, got given a chance and that's what I think music's all about and it's one of the biggest songs I've released in the last couple of um, months except the Ed Sheeran stuff it's it's really hit home and um, he's yeah made his day it's a great song too. Well, actually, I was listening to that song and I decided that's when I decided I'm going to reach out to you for the podcast. I was like, okay, I want to reach. And I actually reached out to Macy Gray as well within the same couple of minutes. So putting it out there, I'll be interviewing her shortly. (laughs) So you do your own type of music when it's just yourself and then you collaborate with Ed Macy, you know, all these various other artists. What's the difference between when you do your own stuff? And when you collaborate with other artists, do you prefer one or the other or you equally enjoy both? Give us the rundown on that. Okay, so I equally enjoy both because usually uh, 90% it's me releasing the songs and they're featuring on my music. So it's almost like my release. So most of the songs that I've done with Ed, he's released three, I think, with me on his in his early days. But now he's fiercely kind of just it's just ed so i kind of like you know i'm i'll be honest i have to because uh I, i'm not so into his music i don't listen to it i would never buy it and i'd never listen to it if he wasn't my cousin um so i'm much more proud of my songs with tupac macy gray uh, ghostface killer i'm a hip-hop head at heart and um yeah. you know that's that's just is and the stuff we wrote because he's so contracted and signed up to Warner's and everything that uh, I can't actually do new songs with him and I'm not sure I want to anyway because I just feel like it's kind of riding on coattails and things so I'm much more proud of these collaborations with these um, artists that I respect from childhood uh, like you know Tupac and um, Wiz Khalifa I mean not from childhood that that uh, one but um, there's so many uh, great artists that I've been working with it's just it's been like a dream come true so um, my own stuff, I feel like I can be a bit more personal, whereas the features, I have to be a bit universal. So I have to kind of make it a little bit more universal in the in what I'm saying and the, the narrative of the song and um, make it, yeah, just, just kind of concentrate on, on the hooks and make it more radio friendly, whereas my own personal things, I can do whatever I like and I just feel I don't care if radio play it. So that's the kind of difference. I just feel like my own songs is just me and about my own experiences and stuff. But the problem is when um, I'm in Denmark and I'm happy living you know, here with my daughter in this house and you know, I've got my dog and my garden and everything just seems great. So I find it hard to like find that struggle and that pain to write to. So a lot of my <laughs> stuff is very happy. 
Whereas when I was back home in Bristol and I was going through a lot of uh, bad times, I would write every day. It would just pour out of me. So it was like therapy. I find that if an interesting collaboration comes on, it's a, a topic that um, challenges me a little bit and I can go deep and really get into myself and write something amazing, then it always comes out very well. So I enjoy both processes, to be honest. But when I put pen to paper, there's always a reason for it when something comes out that's magic because it needs to haunt me almost to make me actually speak about it and uh, give me a kick up the arse to actually put pen to paper and go, wow, I feel this and it's so deep and painful that I have to express myself about it. So, yeah, it's a great question, actually. Uh, I think both, but generally my own stuff um, turns me on more to write to and stuff. It makes me feel more like... um, just free and it's like it's me it's my it's my life you know i've actually did this did a song called my life about that so it's crazy yeah. you asked that so uh everyone should go check out my life alone star um because yeah i'm just talking about it's my life and i have to live it how i live it and this is what i do and hopefully people can uh resonate and relate and uh yeah enjoy the track and that's another one that did really well i think people the listener appreciates honesty in your yes. music and if they can write that honesty and you're not just kind of talking you know especially being a white rapper people just think you're talking about bling bling you know bends and girls and parties and stuff that's not me at all because that's my bristol upbringing with massive attack you know they're very conscious i listen to a lot of reggae as well which is very conscious obviously a a great artist for sugar man that uh documentary really touched home because i love bob dylan and things like that you know it's i'm into so many different styles of music like i kind of my own production is kind of operatic and Uh, classical music mixed with 80s and like 90 samples and strings and like cinematic and film score type vibes mixed with all sorts of stuff sometimes I sample children's programs the music from that because I just love the melodies because they're so simple so I think music to me is about the spirit it's not just about there's the music business so you have to have a a business head on you but I leave that to lawyers and management but the music part is definitely about the spirit and i think that's what comes first when you feel it in your heart and your soul i really believe that that's uh that's where the real music comes from so you can write all day about you know whatever that's generic and just to write hooks and choruses for the radio but um i never i never really feel much pleasure with that even hearing it on the radio i mean i've had a number one record a number one billboard and also i've been played on radio one and one extra which is the biggest station here in the uk and uh, i never really felt so much because it was what they wanted to raise them up that's put your hands in the air party vibes and stuff but i guess you have to do both really to sell records you need to kind of you know it is a business as well so it's very much i'm kind of caught in the middle but i enjoy everything about my career so far i'm having a great time making music producing writing singing i've explored singing recently <laughs> and i'm really getting into my singing now and um because i used to write songs but i have other artists come in and sing them or i'd get like Macy Gray, for instance, who would you know sing the chorus and stuff, who's a much better singer than me. But now I'm really loving expressing myself by singing. So there's a bit of tuning going on, but that's okay. What was the kick up the arse, so to speak, to say, okay, I'm going to try singing now? Was it a confidence thing? What was the the thing, okay, that you're going to do it now compared to getting other people into that studio to do it for you? Yeah, great question, because I was just talking to a producer the other day about this. So I became a rapper because I couldn't sing when I was yes. young. So I just left it alone. I just thought, well, I can rap. I'm really good at timing and delivery and, like, lyrics. And Well, I felt I was. And I could kind of do that. But when I was trying to sing choruses, because a lone star does everything by himself, I thought. <laughs> so um, I tried singing. I just couldn't really hit it. And I used to listen to a lot of women singers like Mariah Carey or Celine Dion. So when I was having a shower or bath and stuff, uh, my mum used to say to me, why are you always singing in a high voice? <laughs> uh, because I could always sing really high because I'd be following them. You know, I'd be singing f- female big belter, like ballads and stuff like that. But um, yeah. almost was getting it but I never really sang in my own sort of tone and then um, an artist from Uganda called Herbert Skills um, I started working with him on a project and I was like oh my god I've written this great song but so and so could sing it no you should sing it I really think you can do this and they were huge belters so when I was doing long notes I found them so easy and because they were you know high long notes I would really um, find super easy it was a tricky sort of low end sort of vocals that was tricky, but he taught, you know, he produced me is really, he was a vocal producer and um, we got through it and I've got some amazing songs. So since then I've just kind of continued that 
and um, I've sing, I've sung loads of my hooks. So it's almost like singing. Uh, it's like rap with a melody. Yeah. So I'm not. I wouldn't call myself a huge singer or a huge producer. You know, I don't play a lot of instruments, but I'm a beat maker and a singer. I would definitely say. So you mentioned early on that the writing songs is about the heart, the spirit, and so forth. So yeah. does that heart and spirit come easily each time when you're writing, or is it sometimes a challenge to get those words out? Yeah, I mean, also a great question because I, just before we got on this uh, Zoom call, I was writing a song and it was very deep and stuff, but um, I just couldn't really get into it because I wasn't feeling the emotion really. So yeah, it can be challenging at times to be able to kind of get into that space. I guess it's like an actor trying to get into character, I guess, like to reminisce about certain things in your life that you can reach to give you support to write these songs or help you act that character and um i've got a hell of a lot of stuff in my life that i can go deep and reach out to but i don't like going to some of those places but when i do it comes really dark (laughs) so i think um now i'm just kind of fantasizing with um scenarios and writing songs out of what i wish would happen it's like a kind of fantasy of you know dreams coming true and things like that they're they're really cool because you kind of like it's what you manifest and what you want so i'm writing songs that don't even exist that has happened to me but it's what i want to happen so i'm manifesting it via song basically so even a song about the future in two years time where i want to be things like that so yeah I mean, it is about the spirit. I mean, if you feel it, in my, if I really feel it in my spirit, I really feel like it comes out and it comes out right. And it's just, that's a song that's put there forever in all eternity. And uh, that is my expression at that time, how I felt. And also you can feel a bit naked because when you're exposing yourself lyrically about how you feel and, you know, your anxiety and fears and insecurities and how you're sad and you're crying or you're on the floor, like feeling completely anxious and, you know, you're kind of giving away your whole secrets to who you are. Because in this day and age, I feel like Instagram and TikTok, everyone's just so successful, loads of money, Porsches and traveling the world. And everyone's just talking about all the great stuff. And like, it's vulnerable to be not a success almost. Yeah. But really, it's a part of life, isn't it? I mean, to me, success is a journey, not a destination. And I've always felt that I enjoy the journey. Whereas a lot of artists, they just want to be rich and famous super quick and like get there. And, you know, that's what it's all about. They just want to be famous so they can get all the girls and all the money and all the private jets and hotels and jewelry and but really when you get there everyone i know that's really succeeded to that level have never been happy they look back and go i missed like five years of my life I was working non-stop i was on the road so i didn't actually get to see much of the countries i was touring in because i was either in a bus or a hotel or a plane and i had to rush off and everything's a super rush interviews radio boom 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 and you never really get time to breathe and look at what you're actually achieving and enjoy it so being independent allows me to do that, I find, because I can pick and choose. I can wake up tomorrow and say, no, nope, I'm not doing any of this. And I'm going to take two weeks off. And, you know, so that's what I really love about being independent and having independence in the music business, because I choose what I do and when I do it. And uh, it's the only way. And also I have control, creative control. I can release when I want. So, yeah, I'm really happy with that. And it makes the music that much more therapeutic and makes me happy because I, I'm controlling everything and you know I get 100% of the income royalties and things like that I mean yeah there's splits with publishing and certain you know artists or music um, musicians that have played on the song but generally there's no huge major label taking a massive cut and just you know your, your diary is six months to a day off you cash cow and that's what happens at high level and um, I just don't really like that it's not about I don't think music's about that and stuff, but you know, it's, it depends what you want. I'm all about helping others and helping people. And I don't want to have the number one record in the universe and be the first man to perform on the moon or whatever. Yeah. That's not my, <laughs> that, to me, it's not, it's not selfish. It's ambitious. And I'm very ambitious, but I'm ambitious to help others through music. And yes. there's a time my space was around. I don't know if you know my space or remember it, but there was a social media as one of the first. And uh, you could reach out to people all over the world. And there was a, american woman and this is the first time i felt the power of music and uh she had two native american sons uh, native indian uh half native sons who Mm -hmm. went to war in iraq i believe 
anyway, both of them died and she was absolutely devastated. I don't think they had a father and she lost both sons in the Iraq, Iraqi war. And uh, she was uh, on this MySpace platform. You can have four songs that people can listen to and they can comment and stuff. It's like the first social media. She had listened to one of my songs and it had a Native American flute that I sampled. Yeah. It was called Catalyst. A global themes is world issue kind of is very very positive and about how the world can change and things like that she was about to commit suicide hanging herself she was drunk on gin and uh she listened to my song and didn't kill herself because she listened to my song then messaged me which i still have a screenshot of and said thank you so much for your music i lost my sons and we became friends to this day and you know to save a life for your own music that no one had heard really probably two thousand people on the planet had heard it and she was one of them and to save a life through music, that's what really inspired me and went, oh, my God, you can change lives. Wow, and you've given me goosebumps. <laughs> crazy. So I actually feel like, you know, whether she would have changed her mind or whatever, but she told me that she had um, listened to my song Catalyst and it had changed her life. And, you know, she didn't commit suicide because of that song, because she heard these native flutes and they spoke to her. And it was like, no, you have to live. And I think she's happily married now as well, um, remarried and things like that. I mean, obviously, it's a sad story, but it's yeah. just, in it, it just completely blew my mind and I was like wow I didn't know what to say so, you know I was, a, I was a lot younger then I read that you know you for example you produce bars and melodies um album and a couple of other artists projects when you're producing solely for another artist and you're not going to be involved in the sense of it's not going to be your voice that's going to be heard on the tracks how is that different compared to when you are producing yourself well when i produced the album i wrote some of the raps they did most of it but when i yeah. wrote some of the raps for them it was the first time i've ever really produced uh, another artist and not okay. been on the record stuff so that's yeah that you're, you're right what you're saying how was it uh i didn't actually mind it too much because seeing their success they had a much younger fan base so it wasn't like a competitive thing they were a lot younger than me at the time and um when we recorded, I was just honoured to just get into my production and kind of guide them into, you know, how to work uh, bars and melodies, actually. <laughs> Funny enough, because they were just like, <laughs> rap bars, when do I stop rapping and when do I start singing? Yeah. So the two were um, taking guidance and I had a great team. There was a good budget as well. So we had, I brought a lot of live sounding music into it. So live violins and cellos. And so if you listen to that record, 143, there was a lot of live music in it. And I was experimenting with my production at the time as well. Had brilliant engineers. So I didn't really mind uh, when we were on stage or they were on stage. I usually come in and introduce them. So I had a part of the show, you know, I come on and maybe do one song and introduce them and things like that. So would I do that now? Great question. I don't know. Would I want to be a producer? I think I'm so focused on my own career. I think I'd have to be vocaling on my own songs right now. So I haven't done that since, to be honest. I've not produced a song for another artist except myself since then actually no okay not once you see that, that means uh, i want to do it myself and uh yeah i want to hear my own voice and my own records i think and that's my that's my future i think day and age i'm releasing so many songs i wouldn't have time because i just think if i produce a song for them why not do it for myself back then we had three months to produce an album or four months even but now i'm doing a song a week so to go outside my schedule would be very difficult you're putting that energy you might as well put it into yourself exactly and that's how i feel right now um yeah i'm in such a creative mode right now and uh, yeah i mean i can write a hell of a lot of pop songs and stuff like that right now but i'm kind of trying to get back into the deep and the depth of songwriting and um, i've just been out in Cannes. i was in uh, france yes performing in a show and it was some music uh it was after the Cannes film festival it's the Cannes music festival me Cannes, it's called and i performed headlined it in the evening at the theater out there and then the whole you know, I was listening and meeting songwriters and stuff, and it really inspired me to get back and really challenge myself to get really good at songwriting. The exp it's good to experience that and have great chats with people that are amazing songwriters. You know, there was a guy that had worked with Whitney Houston. He was her piano player. He was talking about songwriting and how he kind of does it. And there's lots of things that I learned from that little trip just now, and it gave me a massive inspiration to come home. So I'm full of energy and full of uh, kind of songs in my head what to write about. As soon as I get a title, I kind of it flows so much easier so i think what am i going to write about which feels generic but once i get some kind of uh, a title of a song it kind of flows out so now while we're talking about songs i love this game i know if i had to ask you this question in two days two weeks two months two years i know your answer and i recognize your answer will be different every time and i'm not saying favorite i'm saying if that you had to push play to five songs 
by other artists once we finish this conversation what would those songs be and by whom number one would probably be fade into you by mazzy star um it would definitely be a bob marley song probably natural mystic knocking on heaven's door bob dylan three four would probably be hmm, uh hearts and men tupac shakur one more would have to be dear mama tupac because that's what started my career so cool I could go on. I could do ten, but yeah, yeah. That's the f- <laughs> <laughs> but you can see the different styles there. Um, yes. Um, so you mentioned you got the you're busy working the new album. Can you give us any uh, sneak peeks or ideas of when's it coming out, what's going to be happening, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I don't have a release date yet, but it's called. I've got a title. It's called Love and Pain, and the first single is called Changes. And I've done the artwork for that and I produced pretty much 60% of it. And I'm just focusing on the live instrumentation of the album at the moment. But it's uh, I'm going to release the waterfall effect on Spotify. So I'm going to release one a week, the same artwork with a different title on the artwork. And I'm going to do 12 of those. And on the 13th uh, will be a bonus and that will be the whole a bonus single. And that will be the whole album all together. So each single will be out each week and then on the final week it will be a bonus song and the whole album together i aim to do it in september october release date because it's a bit of everything it's like my last ep was called ice of face light which is an equal amount of light and dark if you think of a lighthouse for ships dark light dark light dark light that's an ice of face light so this is similar where i have five songs that are very kind of positive i wouldn't say pop and popular like but i'm saying positive and uplifting and then yes five that's kind of a little bit darker a little bit more honest and positive positive but honest and like how there's basically a dark tunnel and then there's light at the end so there's always a light at the end of the songs and then there's two that's a bit of both so okay cool yeah that should be out in september october i'm really excited too because this is my next body of work i produce all the songs write them all there's going to be features on it as well some amazing features um but, but it will be predominantly myself so very excited for that it'll be my new solo project cool so we're looking forward to hearing that later on in the year so jethro the podcast is listened to throughout the world so as a final message to the listening audience what would you like to say live hard love strong stay in touch lots of love big love to everybody that's listening to you and myself and i hope we can do another podcast when the album is out and talk again looking forward to that so as uh, jethro says live hard Love hard, all those beautiful things. This is Slips Vine signing out.